Well, it's my pleasure to get to introduce to you a uh, guest speaker we have here with us today. Uh, I would say he's a friend uh, of our church. Uh, Joel is a guy that was here about 30 years ago as a young man uh, who was disciple in some many ways in this church. Uh, God used him. I remember him speaking even when I was a kid and telling a story about what God had done in his life. And I thought about it. This is a series called God My Story. Uh, how fitting it would be that he could come up and share with us today. He's going to preach for us from the second piece. And so I want to invite you to put your hands together and welcome Joel Engel today. Thank you. I think the last time I was here, uh, Jason was like nine. So um, it's so cool because uh, when I came here, I graduated college. And um, if I think Josh was nine, and now he sings like Jeremy Camp. How many guys appreciate his voice? Well, like Jeremy Camp was up there singing, man. And uh, yeah, Jason's le the pastor. I mean, it's just cool, one generation handing off the baton of spiritual leadership to the next. Isn't that what Christianity should be about? I'm glad somebody believes it. But uh, so anyway, um, I've been a pastor now for 16 years. Before that, I was a Christian recording artist, traveled everywhere. Um, and really, I say the, the advent of my, my ministry uh, really started in, in so many ways here in Poto, Oklahoma. Um, one of the few times that God has ever sp spoken almost like out loud, but not totally out loud. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? It just like three times in my life, and the first time it was here in Port Oklahoma. I stayed at uh, uh, Lloyd and Natalie Yeager's house, and uh, I woke up in the morning, and God told me to move to Port Oklahoma. I'm like, here, and I got my stuff, and and I had no plans after college, even though I spent four years there. Should have had some plans, but didn't. And I came to Poto and lived here for almost two years. It was discipled here at, uh, at, w at what this church was formerly called, Emmanuel Baptist. And w we, we moved into the new building, which is, you know, the old, old building now. Um, but God did a profound work in my life. And as a matter of fact, it was here where I really learned uh, how to preach and how to be a pastor in so many ways. And um, so it's just a, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. A couple of things... Uh, I just, today we're going to be talking about overcoming trials. Um, in the last two years, has anybody gone through a trial? Yeah, raise your hand. Just say COVID and we'll get over it. Um, and, you know, I mean, the world had never even thought about something like that, that had happened like this. And, and it's changed our world probably forever. And yet, the same things happen over and over again um, in history. We deal with trials. Trials are a part of life. But we still don't like to think of trials, especially when we think about getting away. How many, who could use a good vacation? Raise, raise your hand, okay? I mean, there's something about vacation, especially if you get on a boat and you just kind of get out somewhere, you know, and you get in a boat, water's perfect, there's not a cloud in the sky, you can see the crystal blue sky and you can feel the wind blowing over. And you can feel the sun rays, you know, the vitamin D going right into your skin. Everything's starting to relax. The stress is, you know, woo, 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 come, falling off. The water's perfect. We did everything right. We checked the weather. We checked out the boat to make sure the boat was good. We brought all the right supplies. We triple checked. Everything is set. We're now ready to relax. We kind of begin to fade off into a dream. We're relaxing. And then we kind of feel a wave. And then our eyes are closed, but we feel the wind get just a little bit colder, a little bit more wet. We feel a change, but we're not opening our eyes because things are going too, too good. Then we feel the bump. It's a little bit harder, and it gets stronger. And then we open our eyes, and we see our blue skies turned to black and the soft water turned to fierce water and in seconds we are in a storm and we are experiencing confusion, fear, and chaos. And just a few moments earlier, we were experiencing comfort, relaxation, and freedom. 
And we realize that even though we did all the right preparations, our boat's too small. We don't have enough supplies. And there's no way that we're going to be able to overcome this storm. And we're right in the middle of it. Then a rogue wave hits the boat of our lives. And we can't believe it. What do we do? What do we do when the storms of life suddenly crash into our lives? How do we overcome the trials that we did not ask for? How do we overcome the trials that we did not anticipate? Some of you are asking this question today. How did my marriage get here? How did my relationship with my son or my daughter get here? How did we get to this place? How did my health get get here? How did my finances get here? And so often, we who are Christians come in on Sunday and things look okay. We would never know what's really going on in the lives of those around us. And we act like things are fine, but we're actually going through a serious trial that we have to overcome. How do we overcome the trials of life? I'm going to give you six principles today. And check this out. I'm going to give you six points, and we're going to cover two chapters in the Old Testament. So, I mean, this is totally seeker-friendly today, right? So here we go, okay? First principle, and by the way, I challenge you to do this. Today, take some notes, type it in your phone, point number one, point number two. This is going to be six and keep these for the rest of your life. And every time that you go through a trial, every time that a rogue wave hits your life, take these truths out. And I promise you, it will save you a lot of heartache. It will save you a lot of confusion. And here's the first truth that we have to understand if we're going to overcome the trials of life. Number one, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised. So we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 18 and chapter 19. We're going to do a helicopter ride over the life of Hezekiah. Everybody say Hezekiah. Now, there's no book of the Bible called Hezekiah. Sometimes people make a joke, hey, I'm going to 2 Hezekiah. I think I actually did that one time at, uh, here back in the day. I was like, turn to 2 Hezekiah chapter 3, and people were like, where? I was like, it's not a book in the Bible. But Hezekiah was a king. And he was the king of Judah, southern Israel. And probably besides David, he's the greatest king, the most godly king. And he was a man who feared the Lord. Notice what it says here in verse 5 of 2 Kings chapter 18. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. That says a lot right there about his character. He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. And the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. So here we look. And we see a guy named Hezekiah, incredible man of God, incredible leader, incredible brain. When you look at the actual, like, history of Hezekiah's life, the man was a genius. But more than anything, he was a man who would not compromise his principles. And yet, we're about to see Hezekiah under the most intense pressure that a human leader could ever be under. We're about to see Hezekiah in the boat get smashed by a rogue wave. And it's interesting because no matter how many times we hear it in the Bible, don't be surprised when fiery storms come in your life, right? Don't count it awkward that bad times are going to happen, right? Jesus said it over and over again. James said it. The Apostle Peter says, don't freak out when trials happen. But what do we do every single time when a trial comes into our lives? We get surprised because we think 
that if we go to church, love the Lord, read our Bibles, live moral lives, try to raise our kids correctly, try to, to love other people, that our life will pretty much have very little resistance. And so when resistance comes into our lives, it's counterintuitive, but it's not counterintuitive to the scriptures. If you're going through a season of success, can I just tell you something? Awesome, but don't be naive either because a storm's coming. The Christian life is really just transitioning out of one storm into the next. Just trying to give you a little bit of encouragement. You're like, really? Yes, because we live in a fallen world. What do we expect? We're going to walk from one storm to the next. But remember, it's not where we're walking that matters. It's who's walking with us. And so do not be surprised. Number two, don't start to panic. Number one, don't be surprised. Number two, don't start to panic. Now, here, here we see the storm come. Verse 13, chapter 18. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. So Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lachish. Notice this. Notice it says that he did not give in to the king of Assyria. Everybody else gave in. Notice what it says here. I have done wrong. Withdraw from me and I will pay whatever you demand of me. Hezekiah is panicking here. Now check out what he does next. The king of, of, of Assyria exacted from Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the temple of the Lord and in the treasuries of the royal palace. Can you imagine can you imagine like ISIS coming outside of this awesome church and we're so afraid that we just give them everything, we give them our offerings, we give them everything because we're scared that they're going to kill us? I mean, as Americans, we're like, we just can't even think about it like that, right? And yet, Hezekiah goes into the temple of the Lord, strips it bare of the gold and silver to pay tribute to a man who has blasphemed God. At this time, Hezekiah, king of Judah, stripped off the gold, which was he had covered the doors and doorposts of the temple of the Lord, and gave it to the king of Assyria. He panicked. He panicked. And can you blame him? Remember this. You won't read this in the narrative, but the, the city of Jerusalem had already been under siege. Sennacherib and his, and his forces could not gain entry into the fortified city of Jerusalem, but it, it was on fire. People had died. I mean, it was getting down to life and death. So let's not be too hard on Hezekiah here for a moment. It was a dire, dire situation. But he still panicked because he lost his perspective. Everybody say perspective. Say it louder, perspective. When trials come into our lives, it is easy to lose perspective. And when we lose perspective, we begin to panic. We begin to look at the odds, and they're insurmountable. But i got to tell you something. We cannot let fear be the motivating factor in our decision-making if we follow Jesus Christ. Are you with me? We cannot let fear be the motivating factor of our decision-making if we follow Jesus Christ. Listen to me. With all the things that are going on in our country, with all the things that the church is having to endure right now, we don't need elder teams to be men who are making decisions based on fear. We don't need church leadership looking at all of the anti-Christian things in our country to go, oh my gosh, we, we're, we're afraid. We need to do something crazy and try to be cool and stop teaching the word of God. See, we have a tendency to panic. Even right now, for some of you, things have gotten so bad in your life, you're panicking. But I want to tell you something. God is with you. The same God that called Hezekiah before he ever became king is the same God who's with him in the struggle. Number one, don't be surprised. Number two, don't panic. Number three, don't listen to the enemy. So now, the commander of Sennacherib's army, who spoke Hebrew, stands in front of the entire city. 
Every, listen to me, guys. Everybody's listening to this guy. Everybody. Verse 28. Then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern. He's just saying, hey, come out from behind the fortified city and I'll take care of you guys. I'm not going to kill you guys like I killed everybody else. And then he says this, until I come and take you to a land like your own. So come outside the fortified city so I can give you some food and then make you my hostages and have you travel hundreds of miles away from your home in shackles. A land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey. Now he gets down to the truth right here. Choose life and not death. That's what they were looking at. Choose life and not death. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says, the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever deli delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharim, Hena, and Eva? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? And so here we see the lies of the enemy. Don't listen. Don't listen to the Bible. It's a, it's a book. It's an old book. It's so out of date. It doesn't match up. It, it doesn't hold the test of time. Get real, you guys. I mean, take a look at, at science. Take a look at all the things you're telling me that what the Bible says is true. And that's what the enemy does. When we're weak, when we're afraid, when we're down, that's when he begins the onslaught of lies. Here we see uh, a psychological warfare going on. It's exactly what's happening. The commander of the Assyrian army is trying to scare the people into revolting against Hezekiah. Don't listen to Hezekiah who follows God. He, oh, he, listen, he is selling you a line of stuff that's not going to happen. You're all going to die. Instead, let me capture you and take you cap, you know, pr prisoner, and it, maybe it'll be a little bit better for you. And that's one of the great, great things. I've seen so many Christians in this spot when a rogue wave came into their life, they were shocked, they panicked, but here's what they did. They listened to the lies of the enemy, and the enemy shipwrecked their faith. As a matter of fact, I remember 32 years ago, people living here in Poto, Oklahoma, in this area, people that I ministered to, who went through trials, and the enemy caught them flat-footed, their lives have never been the same because they listen to the lies of the enemy. Satan cannot destroy the gospel. So he does everything he can to destroy those who believe the gospel. He divides, he schemes, he deceives, he lies, he stirs up gossip, he provokes distrust, he feeds bitterness. We must put our faith in Jesus and not listen to the lies of the enemy. Number four, seek out godly counsel. So when the storms of life come into your world, when the rogue wave hits, don't be surprised. Don't panic. Don't listen to the, eyes, the lies of the enemy and seek out godly counsel. So all this stuff happens. Now we're in chapter 19. When Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, so Hezekiah says, looks, looks at his officials and goes, listen, you need to go and get Isaiah, the prophet, and figure out what God is doing here. That was the, the wisest thing he did in this whole thing. He goes, we need to figure out what God's saying to us. So when King Hezekiah's officials came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, tell your master, 
This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid of what you have heard. Those words with which the underlings of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Listen, when he hears a certain report, I will make him want to return to his own country, and there I will have him cut down with the sword. So Hezekiah's team goes to Isaiah, and Isaiah says, this is what God says. I'm going to take care of Sennacherib. He's going to leave, and he's going to be killed. Don't worry about it. Now, remember, the entire city is surrounded by 185,000 fighting men. But Hezekiah sought godly counsel. My friend, listen to me. Maybe you've been coming to church. Maybe you've allowed the Lord to get you back on the right path. Can I tell you something? You're going to have trials. You're going to have moments in your life where you feel like you're, you're taking three steps forward and two back. Do you have an Isaiah in your life? Do you have an Isaiah in your life? Somebody that you know loves Jesus, knows the word of God, that is going to tell you the truth of God's word enough that even it might even hurt your feelings, but they care enough about God and about you. Do, have you asked that person to come in your life? See, I want, I want to tell you something. I have never, ever had one person walk up to me my entire life and say, Joel, excuse me, I'd like to disciple you. Would you please allow me to disciple you? I've never had one person walk up to me and go, can, would, and a lot of you guys are like, I can't, you know, I can't believe, you know, I'm, I can't find community. I can't find community. How many of you guys do community groups here, small groups? How many of you guys are here? Raise your hand. Okay. All right. Just make sure. You're like, okay. How many of you guys have small, small groups at this church? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you guys have friends here? Okay. All right. How many of you guys, you're not even sure what you're doing? Okay. Thank you. I, I, I got some of you to raise your hand finally in church. First time in your whole life you've raised your hand in church. Now listen. Nobody's going to walk up and go, excuse me, can I be your new Christian best friend? This is how it works. If you want godly counsel, you have to go find it. You have to go look at somebody's life and go, that's a person who I want to speak into my life. There was a man who lived here, Cliff McDonald. How many of you guys know Cliff McDonald? He came to Emmanuel Baptist Church, and I sought that guy, and I said, Cliff, would you disciple me? He's like, okay, Joel. And man, he taught me the scriptures. I remember Dan Fisher, the pastor here. I, God just told me to move to Poto, okay? I mean, that was hard enough as is. I find this pastor, okay? I thought he was really old. He was 30. I go, this guy's really old. but And we went to the Black Angus, and he bought me steak for lunch. How many guys have ever been to the Black Ang Angus restaurant? Okay, and, and he began to teach me the scriptures. As a matter of fact, we met right over there. That's where his office used to be. A guy named Rick Snyder. How many of you guys know Rick Snyder? Discipled me. Told me a lot of things I didn't want to hear. Sometimes he'd be the only person that could get through to me because I was so strong-willed. Godly counsel. I told Rick in the first service, I said, the, some of the advice that you gave me back in the day, I still leverage today. Who is your Isaiah? Have you asked people to come in your life and speak to you so that you can get a biblical perspective? Do you have people like that? Because if you're going to survive the storms of life, you better have an Isaiah. You better have an Isaiah. Number five, drop to your knees. What do we do when the storms of life come? Number one, don't be surprised. Number two, don't panic. Number three, don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Number four, get godly counsel. Number five, drop to your knees. Chapter 19, verse 14. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. So he takes all these insults and he, op he just spreads them on the floor in the temple. And you can remember where all the silver has been torn off and gold. He's like, Lord, I've blown it. But he still goes back. Because the silver and the gold was not what made the temple amazing. It was the presence of God, the temple, that made the temple amazing. I thought that should get an amen, but forget it. I worked all day on that. Got nothing. For <laughs> for verse 15. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. 
Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Now listen to the nature of this prayer. Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. Do you see Hezekiah's theology? He's not like, oh, Lord, bro, hey, I know you're up there, heavenly, cosmic God. Just, you know, bless this time and stuff and bless our food. Amen. He's not praying some thin, cheesy, weak prayer. He's talking to the king of kings and lord of lords. He's acknowledging who God really is. He sees God as he really is, the sovereign king over every single molecule of the universe. Because you've made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words of Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. Can you see how he's offended that this man would dare speak blasphemy to God? It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste to these nations and their lands. Notice in his prayer, he looks at reality the way it is. He doesn't sugarcoat reality. He goes, yeah, it's true. All these other nations have been destroyed by Sennacherib. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Look, look at verse 19. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand. Why? What's his motivation for this prayer? Why is Hezekiah praying this? Here we see his heart. And this is why there was no one like him before or after because of this line I'm getting ready to read you. So that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. Let me tell you something. My prayer for all of you is that you would not just care about what happens to your own life. That you would not just be a person who prays out of self-preservation. We need less prayers of self-preservation and more prayers of God-exaltation. You can Twitter that. I just made it up. Now, Hezekiah faced the truth. You see his theology, man. I love this quote by F.B. Meyer. It says this, The great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. F.B. Meyer. The great tragedy of life is not unanswered prayer, but unoffered prayer. When's the last time that you cried out to God to deliver you? Not just for yourself, but for his namesake. God, do a work in my life, in my family, that would be so significant that people would know that you're God. Lord, do a work in my life to such a degree, would you deliver me from this, this circumstance in your time so that everybody who saw what was going on in my life would have to give you praise, would have to give you honor and glory. And that's the kind of prayer that I want to be able to pray. I don't always pray that way, but I want to be like that. Don't be surprised. Don't panic. Don't listen to the enemy. Get godly counsel. Drop to your knees. And lastly, Stand on God's promises. So, check this out. Here's what happened. God told Isaiah, and Isaiah told Hezekiah that the king of Assyria, Sennacherib, was going down. Check this out, verse 35. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. I should say so. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. One day, while he was worshiping in the temple of his god Nisroch, his sons, Adramelech and Sherezer, why would you name your two kids such evil names? Killed him with a sword. No kidding. She named him Benjamin or Ryan. They escaped to the land of Ararat. And Esarhaddon, his son, succeeded him as king. Now, here's what's interesting. Before these events, Isaiah spoke another word to Hezekiah. Look at me. Spoke another word. And it was God talking. And God was talking to Sennacherib. 
And, and God did some holy trash talking. I love it when God talks trash in the Bible. I gotta tell you, I'm sorry, but I just love it. Listen to what God says. This is 2 Kings 19, verse 27. So God is speaking to Sennacherib. He says, but I know where you are and where you come and go and how you rage against me because you rage against me and because your insolence has reached my ears. I will put my hook in your nose and my bit in your mouth and I will make you return by the way you came. I just love it when God talks trash to his enemies. It's awesome. So the angel of the Lord took out 185,000 of his men, all because God never breaks his promises. Look at me. God promised to deliver his people. He promised to deliver Hezekiah, and God delivered on his promise. May I tell you that God will never ever compromise one promise that he ever makes to his children. And every single promise that God has ever made to every single one of his children has its yes in Jesus Christ for us today. How does this apply to my life? Sennacherib is the evil one who's always trying to ruin our lives, who's too big, who's always surrounding us, and we wind up doing idiot things like can we say that here? Sorry, edit that from, I'm sorry, custom pastor. But, you know, we strip down the silver and the gold out of fear. We do all these panicking things. And yet God still delivers us from evil. How good is our God? What trials are you going through today? Hmm? What trials are you going through? Is it your marriage? Nobody knows. And you've walked in here today and you feel like it's just hanging on a thread? God knows. He wants to deliver you. Don't panic. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy. Get back to God's promises. Say, I, I've, I've got a child and our relationship is destroyed because of things that I've done. Don't give up. Drop to your knees. Face the brutal reality. God can handle the truth. Call out to the Lord. Joe, my finances are a mess. I don't even know where to start. Start here. Start right here. Don't be surprised that we make a mess of our lives. Don't, don't panic. And remember this. God never fails his children. He will get you through this. And he'll teach you something that goes far beyond what money or wealth can ever give you. You know what I love about God's promises? God's promises are like a lion. Who's ever heard of defending a lion? <laughs> Who's ever thought about defending a lion? The war of God is a lion. Would you just bow your head for a moment and let me pray? So Joel, today, I, I need God to break into my life. Just raise your hand where you are. There's nobody looking. Just... Raise it up high. Say, I need the Lord to break. I need a breakthrough in some areas of my life. Just raise your hand and put it down. Lord, we thank you that you are faithful. You never break your promises. Lord, we love you. And we just ask for this time that your Holy Spirit would soften our hearts. That your Holy Spirit would give us wisdom. And we pray this in your name.